Like dissolves like. When we say this in chemistry, what we mean by like is similar. So things with similar intermolecular forces can dissolve each other. Water, H2O, is called the universal solvent because it has a lot of different kinds of intermolecular forces. It's polar and it can do hydrogen bonding. So it dissolves things that are ionic or a little bit polar or that will hydrogen bond. Here's water dissolving stuff. We've done this lab before. There's a certain amount of energy required to spread the liquid water apart and a certain amount of energy is required to dissolve the solute crystal. So these steps right here are endothermic. They require energy. Energy has to go into the system to make this happen. And then when the two things mix, a lot of energy is released. It's similar to the idea that when bonds are formed, energy is released. So overall, this process might be exothermic or endothermic. It depends on the size of the individual steps. So water is good at dissolving things that are polar, but it's not so good at dissolving things like wax and oil. These are things with big London forces, and water does not have big London forces. So even though they look like they're repelling each other, that's not really what's going on. Instead, these great big molecules like wax or oil or um, gasoline, they just love each other. They've got huge London forces because they're great big nonpolar molecules and they stick together really, really well. On the other hand, a big molecule like this doesn't really stick to water very well. All that's going on between the two of them is a little tiny London force attraction. Only little because water is really little. Water, same thing. Two water molecules next to each other. Oh man, they are stuck together. They got their hydrogen bonding going on. They're polar. They're really quite attracted to each other. But then, you know, water gets next to a big oil molecule like this and it can't do any hydrogen bonding. It, its polarity is irrelevant. So they don't stick very well to this big molecule. So it might look as though water and oil are repelling each other, but really it's just that the water molecules want to stick to other water molecules, the oil molecules want to stick to other oil molecules, and they just don't mix. No chemistry. So if you want to dissolve something waxy or oily, you need a solvent that has big London forces. They won't dissolve in water. Carbon tetrachloride is a common solvent for molecules like this, or gasoline or kerosene, uh, or you could use soap. We're all familiar with soap. If this black stuff is something that has big London forces, as most dirt is, it's usually organic, has a lot of carbons and hydrogens, it's not polar or anything, that's dirt, waxy, oily dirt. If you want to get rid of it, you can use soap. Soap has, remember, the one end, this long yellow end that's hydrophobic. It's usually actually a long hydrocarbon, very similar to dirt. It has big London forces. It'll stick in the dirt. And then it's got a hydrophilic head. It's usually an oxygen atom with a negative charge on it. And that'll stick to water. This head is attracted to water and the whole thing is going to move along with the water and go down the drain with the water. Here is soap in action. Huh, yeah. Scrubbing helps. It helps to get uh, these into littler pieces with uh, soap molecules surrounding them. Here's your cell wall. You might remember it from biology. Very similar to soap. It's got your hydrophilic head and your hydrophobic tail. And uh, here's the cell wall. It allows us to keep one aqueous solution inside the cell with a different aqueous solution outside the cell. The hydrophilic heads point into the liquid. Many large biological molecules have hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts like soap. They also have acidic and basic parts. This is what makes your large biological molecules work for the most part. They're so huge that we have to kind of break down the structure into parts. There's the primary protein structure, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So all of these structures are present. They're just like different aspects of the structure. 
the primary structure, we don't even bother with like saying how many carbons and hydrogens and sulfurs and things are in there. Instead, we just tell the sequence of amino acids. Since all of your proteins are made of amino acids, and there's only like 11 amino acids in nature, this is an easy way to tell the basic structure of it. And they're showing this like it's a chain of beats. It's a good way of thinking about it. You string amino acids together and they make your basic structure of your protein. Here's an amino acid. It's called an amino acid because it's got this NH2 part. That's the amino part. You know, when you see that AM beginning in a chemistry word, it usually means nitrogen, like ammonia or amino acid. And the acid part is this COOH part. If you look at this amino acid and this amino acid, you can see there's very little difference between the two of them. The only difference is this R group which is not really an R, you know, there's no element that's R. It's representing some group. It might be like a methane group, a CH3, or a sulfide group, an SH, or it might be an OH, you know, there's a few different things it can be. Like I said though, there's only like 10 amino acids that appear in nature. There's not that many of them. Because of the NH2 group and the COOH group, when two amino acids come together, they can react easily. This OH group reacts with this H group. Water is formed. It's called a dehydration reaction when water forms like that. And that leaves the C and the N free to bond with each other. So we've just strung these two amino acids together and you can put on another one and another one and another one. And pretty soon you've got this long chain of amino acids like this. That's your primary structure. It doesn't really tell you very much about the protein though, you know? You might think, well, that's the structure, but it's not the most important thing about the structure of the protein. To understand the secondary structure, you've got to notice that, oh, this NH group, it's an N, very electronegative, and H, it could do hydrogen bonding. And it does do hydrogen bonding either with the oxygen on another amino acid because that uh, extra electron pair there could hydrogen bond with the hydrogen or with another NH group, same thing. So hydrogen bonds could form there or there. And what's weird is these hydrogen bonds can form with one protein up here and another protein down here, or they can form within the same super long protein. So when they're forming with neighbor proteins, it's like you have a bunch of these chains right here laying side by side and hydrogen bonds form between the two chains. Your skin is like this, I believe. And then uh, sometimes though, this amino acid will form a hydrogen bond with this amino acid and that'll make the whole chain curl up like this. This is a helix, we've seen it before in DNA. And even this structure, the secondary structure, is not the most important thing about a protein structure. Instead, it's these two, the tertiary and quaternary structures, that are the most important. They determine the overall shape of the molecule so that it can do what it needs to do. And these shapes are caused by those R groups. Those R groups, some of them are hydrophobic, some of them are hydrophilic. So the hydrophobic ones are going to want to be inside. The hydrophilic ones are going to be out in solution here. Some of them uh, bond rather strongly with each other, the sulfur ones. Anyway, the whole thing kind of curls up a certain way, depending on whether it's in an aqueous environment or not, depending on the pH and depending on the temperature. So you get these big, huge molecules and they like fold up a certain way. Here's your blood cells, your red blood cells. Geesh, look at that thing. It's so complicated and it's huge. And it's all for carrying oxygen, which is tiny. You know, I'm not sure where the oxygen fits in here. I imagine right in the middle here or somewhere, but maybe not. Maybe it just fits right there, you know? It's oxygen. These are the iron atoms. They're bigger than oxygen. A lot of times people will show enzymes in your body with this schematic diagram like this. But remember, this thing is really huge compared to this thing usually. So it's kind of inaccurate. The other thing that is a little misleading about this model, I think, is they make it look like a lock and key. Like it's the shape of the molecule that's really important. 
And it's not really the shape that's so important as, uh, you know, attractive forces on one molecule and repulsive forces on the other molecule. The thing slots in and fits into the protein, but not necessarily because of its shape. It might have to do more with like, pretend there's a magnet here and a magnet here, you know, and that determines where it fits in and what happens to it once it's in there. We could spend weeks talking about protein structure and how they work, but we're not gonna. Uh, I just want to mention it because it's a common question on the AP test. Uh, they'll give you big, huge, fancy proteins and ask you, where are the hydrogen bonds going to be? Or uh, they give some sort of general questions about enzymes. You should know what one is. Something that's kind of interesting about enzymes is you know, the tertiary and quaternary structure is determined largely by the different R groups moving away from or towards water or acid or base or different salts that they're attracted to. So if any of those change in your body, if the temperature changes dramatically or your pH changes in your blood, the protein shape is going to change and it won't work anymore. We say that the protein is denatured, it won't work anymore. You can see this when you cook meat or fry an egg. That protein right there is denatured. It looks a lot different and it's not working the same way, all because it just changed its tertiary structure a little bit. Gas solubility and vapor pressure. Whoa, you guys, I don't know why, but this is a commonly missed question on AP test quizzes and you know, the big test at the end of the year. <sighs> okay, just think about Coca-Cola. When is Coke bubbly? It's bubbly when it's cold and you first open it. If you leave it open for very long, exposed to lower pressure, the bubbles all disappear. And if it gets warm, the bubbles all disappear. So what does this tell us about gas solubility? Well, gases are more soluble when the liquid is cold and gases are more soluble when the gas pressure above the liquid is high. This makes sense. You know, when the liquid is cold, the molecules aren't moving as much and they're less likely to leave the liquid and go into the gas phase. And when the pressure is high above the liquid, when the gas pressure is high, then more gas is forced into the liquid. Ah, here's a picture of it. There we go. Increase the pressure, more gas goes into the liquid. Ooh, I think that's the end.